Design. 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 Design means to plan. Human. Substance. Technology. Designing for a better future. What is design really? Let's talk about design. Making an impact in the world. The power of design to improve life. Design to survive. Around 12,000 years ago, humans moved from hunter and gatherer to breeder and cultivator. We became farmers, traveling, taming, and tasting the natural world around us. Over generations, we identified the best plants and animals and modified them to grow faster, bigger, and more bountifully. We wrangled the wilderness into a source of nourishment and profit. Now, almost everything we eat is by design, just as our modern food industry is by poor design pushing our planet to the brink. With a constant demand for choice and convenience, the system has grown exponentially with little thought for its impact and longevity. Today, about half of the world's habitable land is used for agriculture and producing our food accounts for just over a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. We've turned forests into endless fields, farmed almost every ocean floor. Government subsidies are keeping fishing boats fishing, even when there are too few fish left for fishing to be profitable. And can't put an exact figure on the billions of animals we consume yearly. And if you just serve it pink with some juice and flavor, Freddie, it's yeah. delicious. I'm allergic to vegetarians. While global hunger steadily falls, our population is rapidly on the rise, projected to reach 9 billion by 2050. The imbalance of more mouths to feed with our finite natural resources presents a seemingly impossible conundrum to solve. But without serious limitation or fundamental change, we're eating our way into extinction. Sustainable farming practices are slowly emerging, but are they enough to right our wrongs and secure a viable future? Or perhaps it's time to recognise that food security won't be found by further exploiting plants and animals, but by taking them entirely out of the equation. Welcome to Can Design Save Us, a series exploring design as a pioneering force for good. We dive into the most pressing problems of our time and meet people using design to solve them. We explore the good, bad, complex, and controversial. My name is Leslie Price, host from The Index Project, and my guest today is Passy Vinicka, CEO of Finnish company Solar Foods. Solar Foods won an Index Award in 2019 for their pioneering product, Solene, a superfood made from thin air, produced from CO2 and electricity using a similar process to brewing beer. Solene is a hundred times more climate friendly than any animal or plant based alternative when it comes to water use, land use efficiency, and greenhouse gas emissions. So, I should say welcome, Pazzi, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Great. It looks like you're. Are you in the Solar Foods lab? Yeah, this is my office room. I remember when we first talked in. 2019 that you mentioned your location was still a secret. Is that still the case? Yeah, the same setup uh, continues. Okay, what was the reason for that? I, I remember you told me, but I've actually forgotten. Can you fill me in? No, we don't want to invite people to come over in, in general. So time a bit trying to limit that. People coming, dropping by the, by the door, you know, um, People very interested to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, as well. <laughs> Great. So Solar Foods was founded in 2017. Before that, you worked in renewable energy. And then you had a pretty stark realization that sort of was one of the motivations for moving into Solar Foods. Can you explain to me what that was? In what comes to, to my personal travel towards Solar Foods, uh, there were two things. One, one thing was that um, I was doing renewable energy research and uh, uh, primarily coming from the middle of forest in Finland, we were focusing uh, on bioenergy. And uh, it was a specific event when I realized that the, the biomass resources 
uh, are not infinite. We can't really solve the energy problem based on biomass resources, or we just would need to cut all the forest plus more second planet to to um, supply all the energy what we need. What has to do with biofuels and uh, and stuff? Uh, so we needed to to uh, find something else, and that led me to to work on renewable power, solar and wind primarily. That about ten years ago were not competitive at all. Um, but then we started. We were able to pull together a large research program around. Uh, solar wind energy storages uh, to, to become kind of a research program, national program. And in that research then we had uh, uh, one specific key finding which was that we need to electrify everything. So instead of burning, mining fossil fuels, burning in, in, in um, engines of cars, in power plants for, for power and heat does not work out, but we need to electrify with renewable power or some say nuclear, it doesn't really matter here, everything. So electric vehicle is a classical example how you electrify transport instead of uh, using the concept of burning. And so primary uh, electricity is the new primary energy. Uh, and now it's a more the question that where do you start to use that electricity, mm -hmm. solar in the, in the sun belt. And that's also what Solar Foods is, is today doing or proposing actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I think you mentioned it was really sort of quite shocking in, in an interview that I saw that you said that even if we transitioned the whole globe to renewables, it still wouldn't be enough to stop global warming. It is a fact. Uh, a food system is a child with many problems which for a researcher makes it very interesting. We use pesticides, uh, uh, the loss of habitat, do, do turning forests to agriculture land, 70% of fresh water is used for irrigation in agriculture, um, and the global fish catch, wild fish catch peaked 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And since then we've founded, uh, established a new industry on the planet called aquaculture. You don't notice that uh, at the supermarket, there is still fish, but it's not natural. It's real fish, but it's uh, it's due aquaculture, not, not wild catch. So there are several problems. And then again, uh, on a higher level, the climate problem is quite simple. About 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions due human action is due to the energy what we use, and about 25% is due to what we eat. And there are technologies to set in decline the emissions from the energy system. Uh, and uh, and but then again, with the increasing population, increasing standard of living, which usually means increasing use of animal-based protein, the emissions from the food system are set to increase. And after, let's say, 15 years from today, 20 years from today, um, 2040 or something like that, the the emissions from the energy system and emissions from the food system will be at par. Mm. Uh, so therefore, we need to to come up with something fundamental to to show roadmap to an emission-free food system and that's what solar foods is doing go to the very root cause of the emissions uh, from food system so solin uh, people are calling a miracle substance or food made from thin air so it is similar to a flower is that a, an accurate representation I know you've also called it the new wheat um, yeah what actually is it it is um, at the end. It is a powder that is nutritional and its main composition are very similar to to soy or algae or even dried meat. If you look at the composition, so something very familiar. What we already know uh, in the form of of powder, and the powder. Uh, um, appearance has to do with the fact that it's a single cell protein. So we are growing single cells about uh, organisms that are that are about two micrometers in in, in diameter, and uh, uh, there is. Uh, so we are using just the diversity of life here. The the organism, what we grow, it's naturally occurring. You can find it in in nature. What is new, and maybe not traditional, is how we uh, grow and harvest it, and that's what kind of the technology part for which we use uh, fermentation technology. 
Mm-hmm. That's similar to brewing beer, for example. Correct. Everything on higher level, it's the same of, of uh, brewing beer, making wine, but but uh, we don't use yeast in the fermenter, but our microbe, and this microbe does not eat sugar, but it eats small bubbles of, of uh, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Mm-hmm. So where are you guys at now? I mean, if we were to scale this, would it just be a matter of having more vats for fermentation um, or what would sort of that take? Yeah, correct. That's one of the uh, unfair sales points of this technology that we're not dependent on arable land. We're not really dependent on on climate conditions. Um, And uh, if you want to Uh, secure the supply. It also works there because if you want to double the production, you just invest to another fermenter. Mm-hmm. So therefore, there are these uh, these features. Now we are uh, as a company in a uh, kind of dis- decisive point or interesting time. Uh, in our timeline, we have about 30 months behind us. Uh, and in, in the past 30 months, we've uh, built the first small uh, production line, which we call a pilot. We we have the organism, uh, we have produ- uh, produced or made about Uh, about 20, 30 different kinds of food products using our powder, which we call a food ingredient. Um, we've proven it's safe, nutritious, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now, recently, we raised additional funding and go into the next 30 month period, uh, which is a, a go to market mm-hmm. package. Um, we're going to build a small factory that we call a demo or demonstrator. Um, and uh, in late 22, early 23, uh, we are going to be on the market with um, with Solin. It's very exciting. I'm looking forward to trying it out. I, I read another interview that you guys plan. I'm not sure how accurate this is. Uh, you guys plan to make two billion meals a year by 2020. Is that uh, still feasible? You think? That must be 2025 with the big factory. Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, it's about five. Uh, five million meals uh, is, is the initial production with a demo uh, and then um, that we can scale as a function of the fermenter volume uh, and uh, and the full scale factory is about um, uh, 100 times to that so it's, it's a half a billion of uh, of meals but then there is no upper limit uh, basically you can it's just a matter of time to to invest into these factories Um, and um, yeah, that is the roadmap. What we're going to to then follow it depends how quickly, quickly we can expand. I imagine people react relatively strongly to these kinds of future foods. Either they're amazed, or sometimes they're actually a bit concerned. Um, how has the public received the product, in your view? It's very interesting times if you think of um, some new technologies, whether it has to do with mobile devices, if it's uh, social media and different kinds of apps, uh, e-commerce, electric vehicles, solar and wind power, batteries, all these are new technologies uh, and, and the characteristic for Uh, these times is that technologies are developing faster and faster and and uh, uh, the man is surprisingly adaptive so something that works then then the man tends to stick with it and adapt and, and take it into in, into use um, the same applies in my view to to food uh, if the new foods whatever they are are good they are are reasonable cost they are nutritious they taste good so there is taste and convenience and price uh, is, is right then it will succeed uh, we have um, um, 
learned that in, in let's if we go five years back in time, hardly anyone was really talking about food tech and uh, that kind of things. Uh, some plant-based material um, could have been there, uh, but not really in in the mainstream discussion. But now it's it's uh, uh, in, in the highest level of strategies, whether it's European Union or or, or individual countries uh, and the companies and venture capitalists are, are investing heavily to it. And all this happened in only a handful of years. And uh, therefore, starting with insect protein, perhaps um, people get more and more familiar of the new ingredients and uh, they are not frightened, but they are kind of amazed and, uh, and intrigued by the idea of something, having something completely new. But the taste at the end is a decisive factor and that's what we are liable to deliver as a company to the consumer. Mm -hmm. You had a brilliant an analogy last time we talked where you, you referenced it to like selling the internet in the 80s, that it was very hard to sort of convince people of the possibilities because it is such a such a new technology. Yes, um, often in, in this business, when you um, are interviewed or you climb on, on, on stage, you need to defend the jobs that doesn't exist. You're defending future where you have not been. Uh, therefore, you need to be able to describe uh, possible futures and give descriptive uh, descriptions of what can happen if you think and, and try to pull together some something in analog to uh, to what we are doing in food tech now, you could imagine that you are in mid 80s, early Microsofts or Apples, almost operating in garage, uh, hardly any pe personal computing, no information communication technology really. Um, if you would have uh, in those days, mid 80s, uh, tried to describe the consumers or, or investor the concept of internet, the concept of mobile handheld devices, web browser in these mobile devices, uh, applications, apps, um, GPS, location services, uh, Google Maps, <laughs> and uh, then uh, apps of part of which are called apps for social media that actually are so uh, decisive and central place in the flow of information in the society that it can really uh, uh, change the politics uh, of, of whole nations. That would have been very hard pitch in the mid 80s. So if we are here now with the full technology. Uh, we are developing one thing that can empower new technologies. There, there are others. So I can see that there can be similar kind of development uh, um, based on all this that will take us to a future where we can produce egg without chicken, milk without cow and, and uh, meat without killing. And it will be so obvious after 15 years from today. Mm -hmm. Have you guys done a lot of consumer testing or what is your view on that? We haven't really done consumer testing. That is to come. Uh, and uh, it's a bit two-headed sword in my view. One is that we know for sure that there's a lot of interest and pull. We can see that plant-based uh, meat alternatives, plant-based dairy, these are early um, uh, alternative foods are, are succeeding on the market, so the consumers are ready. What we are doing is, is a bit uh, more technical to describe, it, maybe. Um, it's not really um, uh, synthetic, but it's, uh, it's very natural, but, but uh, not traditional. Uh, and uh, we are not, to be honest, sure uh, how we should position the questions if we would go to the consumers because I'm afraid of the, the Henry Ford syndrome, which is kind of a famous quote, uh, Henry Ford uh, uh, having said that in the early phases developing a concept later known as car, uh, that if he would go to the consumers and ask what they want, they would just reply by saying we want a faster horse. Uh, 
uh, and therefore we need to further explain the future uh, and to simply integrate into smart and good tasting products and uh, based on that then let's see yeah brilliant I, I like the idea that you talk about it. it's uh, obviously the process is different but you're really focused on giving the same consumer experience Solene, it, it as you mentioned it takes plants and animals out of the equation is this how you see the food industry sort of heading towards for example will rearing livestock be a thing of the past in your view we are often asked that in, in, in the future, what we are, you're trying to describe, what about farmers? And um, farmers are not, are not going anywhere. We do still need plant-based material, calories, foods, plants, fruits, vegetables, grains. Um, what can be questioned is the concept of animal and industrialized animal keeping. Mm -hmm and scaling of that. Uh, and one example is that if you would put on a pile all the birds on the planet, 70% of them would be chicken. So if we want to scale that industry, what's the target figure? So if 70% is if not, if not enough, how much should it be? Right. And uh, it, it sounds quite unreasonable. <laughs> Uh, target or unnecessary perhaps even and uh, it, it doesn't scale uh, and uh, therefore to begin with we would need to cut the d increase in animal-based protein production and maybe replace it uh, after some time uh, and uh, it's already quite a lot to achieve so we are not here to to get rid of farmers competing with farmers but but um, animal keeping uh, meat industry as a whole is with question mark has it changed um, your sort of personal habits working with solar foods um, it has in a way that I of course there there's overall awareness what's what's ongoing i haven't my personally i i haven't let meat go yet completely <laughs> yet. Uh, but of course looking at uh, looking at it uh, carefully and um, what i'm following actually is that what kind of experience a narrative new foods that are more and more in the shelves of supermarkets, what kind of narrative offering experience they have to offer. Mm -hmm. And through those experiences, then we can capture the attention of the consumer. That's more where, where I focus. Mm -hmm. You've talked about um, what I was quite surprised. Maybe I want to, if I, if you allow, I could, sure. I'd like to continue. Of course. What I'm, well, We've discussed about plant-based material, agriculture, and, and, and uh, uh, animal keeping. Uh, what I'm most concerned of is actually the conditions of the seas. Um, it has maybe the, the trash and plastic problem, but also we are, we are literally emptying the seas. And uh, that's I'm, what I'm mostly concerned of. So the first a bit surprisingly maybe what, what I'm most critical is is actually looking at the uh, fish do do aquaculture because it's it's everywhere uh, in in the supermarkets every day and um, that's already due to the fact that we that, th that the seas are in kind of e extinction it demonstrates in every labeling of fish, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I'm I'm more more mostly struck of. I think uh, you mentioned was it that the last wild marine catch was twenty years ago? Was that right? The largest global wild marine catch was ninety six, and after, since then it's been in decline. Even though we are using uh, a lot more larger fleets and more engine power to go to outer to to the seas to to for for catch mm -hmm. 
With these new technologies and food products, um, people can often express concern about the ethics or the morality, for example, if these technologies land in the wrong hands. Have you had an experience um, where someone's approached you to use Solin for a cause that you couldn't get behind or that you couldn't support? Um, what has to do with our product, not least to EU regulation, we are using a naturally curing organism. So if you're against us, then you're against wild berries. The only difference is that uh, our organism is, is very much smaller, so small that the man can't see it, feel it. If it would have been capable of doing that, seeing something that is 1,000 of a millimeter, uh, then it, it might have been that historically we've been consuming these organisms already, but we, we couldn't. Um, mm -hmm. I do understand uh, there are technologies that are based on, on GMO, so genetically modifying organisms to, to produce something specific. Um, but there I must say that, that uh, none of these are based on, on eating the actual modified organisms, but they, they express molecules that are identical to what we found naturally in milk, for example. Mm -hmm. And then you, this is what you consume. So um, with time, I'm sure if you uh, need to, to uh, there would be more transparency in the current food system and you would see all the things what, what are happening there and then you would decide that if you take an, an egg that is stolen from a chicken held somewhere or if it's made in a fermenter it, it might be uh, a different debate and uh, these companies who are producing these proteins like ourselves um, in, in a non-traditional way, we just need to be transparent, explain, and let the consumer decide with all the knowledge uh, there will be. Mm -hmm. So it will take some time to to provide kind of equal uh, amount of knowledge to to uh, to the people. For example, um, uh, cow. The concept of cow is taught to small kids in school, but fermentation-based food production, not really yet, to my knowledge. So uh, it's uh, we we are starting uh, this this um, description a bit mm -hmm. from behind as uh, as companies compared to the conventional industry. Uh, let's see. I was actually fishing for that story. I'm not sure how much you could share the, the story that we talked about um, where a company asked you guys if you would be interested in producing fish meal. I'm not sure if you can tell us that story without naming names, if you're comfortable, and, and if not, we can move on to the next question. We, we are often asked uh, to, that if we had a look to, to produce animal feed or fish meal, and uh, we need to carefully think of that uh, from the perspective that do we go for supporting some existing structures uh, in their, their last moments of hope? <laughs> okay. Do we go there or do we let it go uh, and uh, for a specific region position ourselves a bit differently and don't, don't go along with that story. Mm -hmm. No, it makes perfect sense. But when we talk about structures and sort of moving forward, you've mentioned how Soline can feed into other emerging technologies. And one of them that I was quite surprised to hear about was uh, lab-grown meat. Can you explain to us how those two would marry together or complement each other? Yeah, it's quite interesting when we discussed about a personal computing starting developing in, in the 80s to establishing internet and uh, internet browser apps, social media, and then your social media bubble. The same, same analogy is here that we see ourselves instead of producing just a stupid powder, uh, we are a platform technology and the, in the very beginning of it and applying uh, it. Uh, and one of the interesting features of, uh, of using this are those industries that we can empower 
So if cultured meat industry would scale, uh, would be commercially feasible and all those companies would, would uh, have a great success there, um, and then in that kind of futures, if we replace all the cows on the planet uh, with cultured meat factories, which are also kind of a breweries, we would need to produce a lot of feed, not for the cow, but for the cells. They don't just appear from nowhere, but they need to eat. Um, and uh, we are developing growth media, um, being part of that media, basically, um, in which you can grow uh, these cells, uh, basically providing the, the protein part of the story. And uh, therefore we can provide disconnection from the agriculture also for that industry. So at the end the consumer would have real meat, but how it arrived on the plate was completely changed. This is one example of, of unlinear developments perhaps where different technology and companies empower each other so that the future can arrive a lot faster than we thought. Mm -hmm. I like that concept that, for example, we wouldn't be, you guys wouldn't be creating fish meal to support a, a dying industry, as you say it, but actually creating the soline to feed the cells that would grow sort of lab grown meat. It, it's quite a, I mean, it's a very far fetched idea, but it's fascinating that this is probably just around the corner. Yeah, I'm pitching you something here here that will happen in uh, in a quarter of century. So it's a bit difficult pitch, but let's see. When we're a swing chair, we can come back to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a quarter of a century. Is that your genuine? Is, is that the time frame that you would give it? Twenty five years. <laughs> 25 years would be a timeline within which um, we, we would have these things would be in mainstream, I bet. Fingers crossed, I might hold you to that. I'm very interested to see how it all unfolds. For you, um, you talked about this earlier that uh, you're very concerned about the state of the seas. The biggest motivation in working for Solar Foods, is it the, the sort of very grim statistics that uh, sort of keep you motivated in your work? Or is it also the excitement of working for, working with such a pioneering technology? Yeah, what motivates you most, do you think? For a personal motivation, uh, for me, it's very important not to do anything twice. I'm, I'm very, very poor in that. So... You can explore new areas, learn every day something new, and you are surrounded by, by people uh, who are smarter than you. So it, <laughs> it works for me. And uh, um, then, of course, uh, we all as a, in, in the company were intrigued by the, by the huge opportunity. So the in food industry is big. The problems are huge. What we can do and achieve is something fundamental. So of course, it's intellectually also uh, very interesting. Then maybe third point to that is that uh, as a overall, my message to to people who are, who are well educated um, in the developed part of the world, especially uh, uh, and. Uh, also being aware of the fact that that um, the wealthiest ten percent wealthiest ten percent on the planet cause half of the emissions, uh, so we are liable to do something. So it's it's a good uh, simulation to run through that uh, that once you are are in a swing chair, you have grandchildren and they they come to you to ask that okay, grandpa, you were working on this, you were a scientist, you know, you knew climate change and the problem of the seas. What is it that you do? What is it that you did? Right. Um, and um, you you better have a good good answer on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are you optimistic about the future? In terms of no. human, <laughs> in terms of humanity <laughs> being able to perhaps cap the effects of climate change. You wouldn't call yourself an I'm optimist. Not opti I'm <laughs> No, I'm not optimist. I'm not a pessimist, but a possibilist. I like that phrase. And uh, new technologies, open windows to the future where developments 
um, new kind of developments that we can't imagine today are possible. And um, that, that is in, in the heart of, of, uh, of uh, possibilism. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also, when you think of, of technologies, um, human adaption, um, it's, it's very important not to, to create bubbles based on wishful thinking. Um, but if you cut that off and look at the, the um, facts of science, technology, um, you can argue that certain developments can happen and they are the possibilities and possible futures. Um, yeah, that's what I, what I bet on. Yeah, completely fair enough. I like that phrase, a possibilist. It's a little bit a little bit difficult to wrap your mouth around it, but brilliant. <laughs> so what's next for Solar Foods? What are you guys working on now? The most important project what we have now is is what we call go to market. We are a pre-revenue company. We don't have a, a novel food permit yet. That is what we are applying for. Um, the pilot production that we were able to pull together and we needed to invest quite heavily in in the past 30 months this is now operating. We can produce this new material so it can be tested so that it can have a permit. Uh, that's very much in the focus now, uh, developing consumer products based on the ingredient. So if we go to actual food production and consumers, um, they don't really care about the amazing technology what we have, but they look at the nutritional value and the functionality. So what's the mouth feeling and how does it work in the food? So we're working, uh, so more of a detail, more and more details are, are kind of coming and, and what we are working on. Uh, so that has to do with the food development and no novel food part of the story. With the other hand, we are then um, building what we call a demo. So our first commercial small factory, a demonstrator. It's, it's a real thing, but still quite small one. That's why, why it's a demo. And uh, we expect to have the permit for, for food um, and uh, the food products and the demo ready in about 30 months time. Mm -hmm. What are the first products you think we'll be eating with uh, Solene in it? I don't know if I should hold that as a secret okay. or not. <laughs> we'll but, wait. Um, Rather not. Um, uh, we are looking at foods in a, in a holistic way. So it will not be, again, another plant-based sausage. Okay. But it will be more. We're looking at to have something for every meal of the day. All right, looking forward to it. I, do, I like that we have the, it's not a sausage, but uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what it's going to be. But uh, that's all we have time for. And uh, thank you so much, Passy. It's been really interesting, as per usual. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you for listening to Can Design Save Us by The Index Project. I'm your host, Leslie Price, and this episode was produced by Cecil Cole Norgard with music by Christina Lillisko. Join us for the next episode, part two of Rethinking Agriculture, where we explore the enigma of lab-grown meat. <laughs>